Welcome to Releasing Trauma, a Survivor's Podcast. I am your host, Tracy Osborne. I am a survivor of emotional bullying, rape, sexual assault, domestic abuse, and grief. After losing my husband in 2019, I set off on a new adventure to help other women release their trauma and create a life they can cherish. Each week, I will feature a guest expert or a survivor to share their stories, tips, wisdom, and more. The goal is so that you can take away even just the smallest nugget of information you can use in your life right now to make a change and to remind you that you're not alone. There is life after trauma and you can move from victim to thriver and create a life you can cherish. Welcome. Today on the show, I am talking with Sandra Stechwitz, who is a narcissistic abuse survivor an immigrant from a post-communist country and a college dropout, raised by a single mother of five, turned a five times best-selling author and book coach for high-flying influencers. She's a member of a think tank for women in business and technology, a global transformation speaker, and a high in-demand ghostwriter for her extremely busy millionaire clients. Sandra offers a unique perspective as she was turned down at, at college and told her language skills were not good enough. Well, despite her broken English, she defied all the odds and wrote her first first book in 90 days after her toxic partner abandoned her on her deathbed, all while working two two full-time jobs. And then she went on publishing five best-selling books by the age of 34. She now teaches conscious female thought leaders how to get their number one bestseller written and published in 90 days or less so they can scale their soul empire to six, multiple six and seven figures. Wow, that is amazing. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Yeah, thanks so much for a powerful introduction. I'm really, uh, yeah, really excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to talk with you today, and we're going to be talking, um, I know it's a little bit early yet, but we're going to be talking about New Year's resolutions, and here's why. I don't believe in them. I think that resolutions are made to be broken, and Sandra was, uh, became a best-selling author after making her New Year's resolutions, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that today, but I want to hear... Um, a little bit more, you know, first about, you know, you're, you're on your deathbed and your, your partner just kind of said, see ya. Is that what happened? Yeah. So it's a really, (laughs) yeah, it's a really compelling story. So part of my story and the reason I decided to write a book in the first place is because, um, and a short while ago, I was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness that only babies get. <laughs> uh, so it's a variation of uh, of chickenpox. I never had chickenpox as a child. And originally, initially, I thought, we all thought, <laughs> that this was chickenpox. <laughs> so I was um, diagnosed with that illness. I was bedridden. And this is basically when the love of my life <laughs> uh, walked out on me. Um, my family members practically abandoned me. They didn't want to uh, have anything to do with me. <laughs> and also what happened around that time, also lost my job. Uh, so I basically found myself with no source of income. And around that time, I like my landlord kicked me out <laughs> because I was unable to pay the bills. And so like I literally felt like everything that could possibly go wrong <laughs> uh, to <laughs> turn for the worst. And it all happened within six short months. And this is basically when I realized that uh, like being faced with the prospect of dying at the young age of 26, I really realized that I'm meant for more. And this is when I really made the decision to really change my life for the better. And this really propelled me to, first of all, start a business and then further down the road also to write and publish a book, which is like I, growing up, I always uh, wanted to be a writer. So this experience really made me realize <laughs> that life is too short. 
uh, because it, initially I didn't even know what the diagnosis was. I didn't even know what what mysterious illness I had. It actually took me six months to fully recover. I was bedridden for a month and quarantined. Uh, back at that time, my sister was on holiday, so I was practically left on my own uh, to my own devices. <laughs> so and this is I think this, feel that's very. This was all from chicken pox. Uh, it's a variation of a chicken pox. So it's actually Coxsackie virus, which is from the same family of viruses. Okay. And given that I never had chicken pox as a child, um, I didn't build immunity because none of my family members got it. I actually contracted uh, this virus from my cousin's baby boy, who's two years old. My, my cousin also suffered from the same disease but her symptoms were nowhere near as bad as mm. mine uh, so it's very unlikely for adults to actually uh, contract the virus but because none of us neither me nor my cousin had chicken pox as children so we did not build that immunity and that's why our right. symptoms were a lot worse <laughs> well, i contracted chicken pox uh, the reason i ask is because i i got chicken pox around age 35 36 wow. and when I first called the doctor, they were like, no, you don't. I said, I have chicken pox. Yeah. They're like, no, you don't. I said, I have chicken pox. So I came into the office and the first day the nurse was like, cause you could, you couldn't really see anything on me other than some red bumps. She was like, you don't have chicken pox. I came back two days later when I was fully broken out and she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You are, this is the worst case ever. <laughs> so I totally know. I mean, I, I get what you mean about being so sick and everything. I was nowhere near what you went through, though. Um, I was, but I was miserable, that's for sure. So I, I can empathize a little bit, just a little bit, because I was nowhere near my deathbed. Yeah, but I can, I can very much relate to your own experience because at first, uh, even when I told some of my clients, because back then I, I also started out working as a massage therapist. And I didn't know what, what I had. <laughs> and just previously, I massaged a client who had eczema. And then I thought, okay, it's not possible. I, I, I know for a fact that you cannot, like, eczema is not contagious. Right. <laughs> so there was no, um, no possibility of me contracting eczema. But if I had this rash on my hand and feet, I couldn't quite explain. And at first, when I said that I had a rash on my hand and feet, that everyone uh, started telling me, oh, you actually have uh, hoof and mouth. Oh, yeah, there's there's also another one. Uh, I forgot what the what the other uh, virus is called. Mm. As I was actually being told that no, it's actually a variation of of a chicken pox <laughs> that uh, adults usually contract as a result of having had chicken pox as a oh, child. Oh, like shingles. Chicken pox as a child. <laughs> so there is also a level of disbelief. Um, the, yeah. the doctor itself, himself didn't know what the, the actual diagnosis was until I actually got the confirmation from my cousin. Wow. <laughs> so it was a uh, mystery, mystery solved. So, uh, and I was also told that there's really no cure for it. So I basically just right. had to wait it out. And that was wait even added um, well to, I, the, <laughs> to the injury that there was really no cure for, for my symptoms. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like it was shingles, which is what we call it over here. Oh yeah, yeah, shingles. So that was that was the other. Uh, yes, that was actually what some of my clients uh, made me believe. That told me, oh wow, actually I have shingles, but like I never had chicken pox. I was like, child, so yeah, you just skipped the chicken pox and went right to the next one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still live in the well, same family of, of viruses. Yeah, but it's really really interesting goodness. that you also you're also diagnosed with chicken pox. So. Goodness, goodness. Um, okay, so your whole world has completely turned upside down. Your partner left you. Your family's abandoned you. You've been kicked out of your, your apartment. You're sicker than sick. What do you do? How'd you turn it around? Yeah, so that's, that's a really great question because when my full-time job uh, was basically out, out of the question. I, at that time, I started working as a mass, massage therapist, but so given that the illness I suffered from was contagious, and then I had to quarantine at home. I couldn't even leave the house to uh, to get groceries. I had to rely on my clients to <laughs> support me um, to, to, to go out and get food. Uh, so at that time, I also started uh, building my online marketing business. 
and um, so I was really committed because I, with everything falling apart, I basically had no no plan B. Like I basically had to make it work. So I was really committed to getting myself out of the funk that I got myself into. And a few weeks later, I actually uh, started seeing the very first results. And so my complete and after <laughs> surprise, I actually did extremely well uh, with my online marketing business. I hit 10K within four months of starting my online marketing business. Nice. And uh, further down the line, I changed business directions. Um, and I was really in a position to travel around the world, work from exotic locations around the world. <laughs> so you could say that it was almost like a get, I don't know, like a rags to riches story um, but what happened further down the line is actually that um, after a few years like my business is really uh, doing really well I was traveling around the world working from exotic locations and then what happened that business partners started started pulling out completely out of nowhere completely out of the blue actually one of the companies that I work for went bankrupt and they have been unable to pay me <laughs> uh, so basically meant I had to wait like for up to six months to get paid and I basically ended up and square one <laughs> so back to back to where I, where we started basically and I really reached a point where I no longer had money um, to pay the bills I ended up putting my rent on the credit card my rent wasn't like was you know quite high <laughs> living right. in edinburgh at 700 pounds a month and i ended up putting my rent on a credit card at 30 percent <laughs> interest um around that time i was also forced to um start a job not only one because my my money basically all my savings ran out and i was forced to take up a job as a cleaner working for nine pounds an hour so for me that was really a complete blow because I felt like I went from having really the life that everyone dreams of <laughs> to like having a uh, richest rag story and for me that was like I, I feel like there's a lot of shame uh, associated with, with what happened because on one hand like I had all the success I was uh, my story was featured in the New York Times uh, in a book written by a New York Times bestselling author and I had like all the success. <laughs> and here I was like um, working as a cleaner, working like cleaning up after the people I once used to work for. <laughs> so for me, that was like the ultimate epiphany of like really hitting rock bottom, even worse than everything I have I have been through early on. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you back. achieve you achieved all your goals and your dreams only to lose them again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this really made me realize that mindset really is everything because I do feel that on some level in terms of mindset, I wasn't really ready for the level of wealth um, and abundance I have experienced for the level of success I have experienced. Yep. And yeah, on some level, I self-sabotaged my efforts. And this I, basically meant that I, I yeah. up people yeah, down just to maintain my high level of, of, of living, my standard of living right and i was really yeah emotionally i was really done my friends family and followers they all thought that i gave up because they haven't heard from me <laughs> i wasn't very active on social media I actually took time out for a year i didn't post anything on social media i just really needed to take the time to really disappear to really find myself again sure and so for me that was really like, almost like the time like of detoxing, letting go, releasing, and really, I didn't really know <laughs> where to take my business next. <laughs> Obviously, I still have bills to pay. <laughs> right. and, and then I realized, well, you know, I can I can actually turn all my fa failures into my strength. And this was really the turning point for me because I really realized that as a child, all I ever dreamed of was to write and publish a book. And then I really realized, you know what? If this is the last thing I'll fail at, if this is the last thing I do um, before I give up, then let it be. Like, let me let me fail. Like, at least I'll fail at something that I really care about. At least something I'll fail at something that really means something to me. Because um, admittedly, I, I do believe that I was really previously chasing the shiny object syndrome. 
and this really made me realize that well money isn't actually everything <laughs> because it was actually the month that I hit my first 10k that I really realized well actually I'm a, miser I'm a miserable cow because I really thought that hitting 10k that people it's almost like viewed as a symbol of wealth and they're really a symbol of success and happiness that I really realized well actually it didn't make me happy because something something was really missing something really right. fundamental and that was fulfillment um so that really made me realize that was like the turning point for me <laughs> and it was like on new year's eve uh that i really made the decision that i don't really want to live the same year again and i really wanted to invest in something mm -hmm. i really wanted to invest in my dreams and while everyone was out and about celebrating on New Year's eve I actually took out my credit card and invested like a multiple for a figure uh, basically put all my savings <laughs> um, and hired a high level book coach because um, previously I have also tried to write a book on my own and I had like 20,000 words written and I realized I, was, I wasn't really making any progress I was like spinning my wheels I really had I was really direction directionless <laughs> I didn't I didn't know where to take it next and I tried like investing in ebooks and I tried like different, uh, yeah, different, different uh, books and I wasn't really making any progress. And they, they just decided on New Year's Eve, like, you know, this is, this is the, the year I'm going to change my life. This is the year I'm going to become a published <laughs> author. Yeah. How did you make it, how did you make it stick? Because I know so many of us make the same statements year after year. This is my year. This is the year everything is going to change for me. And then by the end of the year, it's same crap, different year. How did you make your resolution stick? Yes, I feel like it's a really great question because prior to that, I don't think I have ever <laughs> made any of my new year resolutions stick beyond February. <laughs> and I do believe that this is the, the experience that most of us have had. Uh, with New Year resolutions and I really realized that well actually it was really pathetic of me that I kept writing down and I, I have had the same New Year resolution for years and years and years and I just realized like how, how pathetic I was <laughs> and I didn't really want to look back on my life and just realize I didn't really want to slave away working for someone else's dreams because I really knew that this wasn't my path uh, and I had all this previous success that no one could ever take away from me despite the fact that you know at one point in my life <laughs> I ended up taking a job as a cleaner but I really realized that this is this is really the turning point um, personally I do not believe in the magic of your your resolution mm -hmm. It's because I, I do believe that it all depends on what energy we put like into what we do. So I don't necessarily believe that there's anything magical about the New Year resolution. It just so happened that I <laughs> um, made the decision on New Year. Because uh, interestingly enough, for example, one of my new ever New Year resolutions was to uh, to get into the best shape of my life. That never happened. I have actually put on <laughs> an massive amount of. Um, I know that feeling. <laughs> 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 yeah so not not all my new year resolutions are really stuck so it's really interesting but i, I do believe and i'm so almost like kind of like old school thinker because what i actually did i really set um clear goals so first of all i hired a book coach and at the one time so having a business i've worked with up to five business coaches and i also realized well well, like I, I have obviously hired people to help me grow my business. So why don't why do I not do the, the exact same with with books? And actually previously uh, have taken some advice from a business coach that I have worked with on how to write and publish a book. And that coach um, uh, has, didn't have a book to her name. <laughs> so that didn't turn out too well. <laughs> Right. And it just made me realize that I really need some accountability, um, being a serial procrastination diva, like I'm a serial recovered uh, procrastinator. <laughs> uh, so that was one of the very first things I did. 
uh, obviously being in a full-time job, what I also did, uh, even though it was emotionally ch challenging for me, I got all my bosses and my coworkers on board. Um, and being an introvert, it wasn't too easy for me uh, to really open up and really tell my bosses, hey, I'm actually writing a book. <laughs> and I actually got all of them on board. And this really helped with accountability because I do believe that the, having that external level of public accountability is really the missing piece. Mm -hmm. um, because whoever that's announcing publicly on Facebook, hey, by, I don't know, in by 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 the end of this year, I will be... Uh, I will become a published author and this really helps because there have been some studies uh, done actually that this really helps like having that extra level of accountability uh, so I not only hired a book coach I also got my best friends on board because I do believe it's also important to have emotional level of support not only Absolutely. Uh, accountability but also emotional level of support uh, admittedly there have been times when I felt like pulling my hair out and like uh, crying on the phone to my best friends and telling them my 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 book sucks, <laughs> and that was being uh, holding space emotionally for me, and this also provided me with that extra level of emotional support that maybe to an extent a book coach, um, even though like despite all their skills and knowledge can cannot offer us. So I do believe that it's also really important to almost like have all your corners covered also in terms of accountability in terms of emotional support in terms of the know-how and I, I believe that I ticked <laughs> up all the boxes and to being old school I also what I like to do is also track my progress so standard length books are about 40,000 to 50,000 words long uh, so for example if your goal is to become a published author in the next six months then obviously you'd want to divide that number by six months <laughs> and then you arrive at the number of like a word count daily word count to really uh, help you track your progress because we cannot really how do we know if you're how well we are doing unless we actually measure and track our progress um, so then I arrived at the daily word count um, or a weekly word count because we see some days we are more creative than others but right. as long as I yeah, stuck to my weekly word count that I knew I was making good progress. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, on some days you can just make up for, for the missed days. And this really also helped me with, with accountability. Um, yeah. and, and your also, system um, obviously works because you're a best-selling author now. Yeah, so it, it does work. I'd say there's really no, no magic. At the end of the day, I'd say it's about consistency. And yeah. consistency, is, consistency is actually one of the missing pieces. <laughs> um, because I do believe that especially in the spiritual or in heart center community, um, there is really resistance to kind of like left brain strategies in terms of focus, consistency. It's very like frowned upon, um, almost like disowned. And I do believe that everything has its place. Uh, whether that's so creativity is almost like con considered to be a very like a feminine trait uh, where focus uh, where focus and consistency is often seen as very left brain very masculine very strategic and I do believe the, the way I see consistency because uh, we often say oh human oh, I have a I have a writer's block but writer's block is really a symptom writer's block is not the cause <laughs> Because uh, the way I see this is um, that writer's book is actually a human construct. Because whenever we feel creatively constipated, is usually a symptom of a much bigger problem. So what I notice and most amongst my clients is usually when they tell me that they feel uh, they experience writer's book is because there's something else going on in their life, whether that's it could be going for a divorce, it could be some health challenges, it could be someone else, it could be a sick child. Uh, it could be finances. There's always something going on under the surface that really needs to be addressed because whatever is going on in our life energetically under the surface really uh, can spill over to our rating because obviously rating is a very creative pursuit. And so that's why I do believe that a writer's block is not even real because writer's block is really a symptom of being out of alignment. So that's why I always encourage all my clients to really establish 
a sacred writing ritual that's really unique to them, that's really unique to their own unique energetic blueprint. It's different for uh, all of us because we're all different. Uh, so the way this works is how to, how to develop a sacred writing ritual is the process I follow is, is to meditate. So meditation could be different things for different people. It could be meditation in motion, could be um, Tai Chi. Some people meditate in motion. It could be uh, closing your eyes first thing in the morning, closing your eyes for two minutes and just going within. It doesn't have to be anything, um, anything, uh, there's no straight strategic or anything <laughs> we don't we don't follow any formulas here so it's all about like connecting to your higher power to your heart self i just find right. that quiet space of just two minutes well this um, has been great thank you so much for sharing um i mean yeah definitely rags to riches story and in you know on top of that you've also not only you've known your passion for years, but you finally have embraced your, your passion and it's, it's no longer work. It's not a job. It's not work. It's just, you're living your passion now. I love that. Yeah. Thanks so much. I really do, do feel that I believe that's really one of my biggest mistakes was really not following my passion because I knew all along, like ever since I was nine year old, little girl <laughs> uh, back then I, I believed I wanted to be a translator obviously uh, growing up in Poland I didn't even know what you know I didn't even know that there was within the field of possibility of me writing in a language that is not my own uh, so I believe that that was the only way I could I could explain what I really wanted to do was to be right. a translator <laughs> yeah well thank you so much for coming on the show with us and you know, telling us a little bit about your story and giving us some great tips on, on not only just overcoming, you know, writer's block, but, but you can use what you gave us in just about anything that you do. So I really appreciate you taking the time out and, and coming on the show. Thanks so much. I really, uh, I really enjoyed connecting with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And listeners, thank you, thank you as always for tuning in and we will talk to you next week on the show.